you have to measure, you know, you have to build a system for measurement. Uh, I think it's, it's Drucker that says what gets measured gets improved. And I, I think a lot of times if, if you're relying on your own arbitrary uh, perception of whether things are moving forwards or backwards. It's, it's not always an accurate outlook. You're, you're sometimes too close to the situation to see the change that's happening. there, NextGen fam. Welcome to Mentor Momentum with NextGen HQ. You are in for a real treat today because we are going to find out another entrepreneur's fantastic journey and what, has, and what has it has taken to get them to the high point that they are at in their careers. We are so, so excited to have Richard on with us today, who is the CEO of Fifth Avenue Brands. He is an experienced entrepreneur, an investor, a speaker. He's been featured in more platforms than I can even list on the this call so you know that we're going to be talking about everything and what it takes to get a brand off the ground and into the limelight. Richard, thank you so much for joining with us today. Hey Rachel, thanks for having me. <laughs> how are you how are you doing on this lovely Wednesday? Doing well. Well it, it, it's a beautiful day outside of New York City, right? So oh. for February this is not bad. You can actually go outside without a huge jacket on. I ran out for coffee and just a sweater today and it was possible. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Amazing. Well, Richard, we're going to dive right in because we have so many good questions to ask you and so many stories to get into. But one of the things that we do here at Next Gen HQ, a little bit of a tradition, is some rapid fire questions because we want to get to know you as Richard the person rather than just Richard the entrepreneur. So are you ready for some, for some fun questions? Sounds good. Fire away. Um, amazing. What's your spirit animal? Hmm, that's a good one. I, I would have to say, uh, well, I'm a, I'm a big dog person, so it would definitely be a dog. Maybe even like my King Charles Cavalier. So. Oh, do you have do you have one of those? Yeah, yeah. Oh, if you want to if you want to bring it out at any point during the interview, please do. I'm a huge dog lover. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. It. What's your favorite book? So my favorite book, there's a lot of them actually. I would say that you know recently. Hmm. You know, when I was younger, I read The Compound Effect by Darren Hardy, uh, which was a really great book for figuring out systems around productivity and, and uh, you know, especially as a young entrepreneur. So I, I would definitely recommend reading that. I love um, it. Yeah. So I, I would definitely recommend reading The Compound Effect. Amazing. You know, I've just added that to my, to my mental book list that I have going because I've never heard of that one before. So I'm excited to learn from it. <laughs> awesome. Amazing. What is your Sunday afternoon nirvana? Playing golf. Oh, can you do that up yep. in New York City somewhere? <laughs> there places to play the, golf here? Not, not necessarily in New York City, <laughs> but there are plenty yeah. of courses outside of the city for sure. Oh, okay. I love that. And what is the, what is your favorite place that you have traveled to? It's close. You know, I, I love traveling to Asia generally, mm -hmm. uh, but I would say within Asia, Singapore is, is definitely one of my favorites. There, there's so much happening there. So Amazing. much energy. Okay. Well, I know when I go to Singapore, I will be reaching out to you for all of the things that up. I need to go experience. Yep. <laughs> Amazing. Richard, now that we know you a little bit better, we want to dive more into the story, uh, into your story and the journey that you've been on, because I think it is full of so many useful lessons that all of our entrepreneurs can learn from. But I'm going to ask you to take a moment, think back through all of your past years in building your career and figure out what is one piece of advice that you would now give your 20 year old self uh you know i would i would tell him to not be uh you know to be patient uh to honestly continue what you're doing as far as you know taking the right actions every day and, and being consistent with that uh but also you know be patient because things do take time to build uh, and you know that there's a saying that uh you know a lot of times you overestimate what you can get done in a year, but you underestimate what you can get done in 10 years. Uh, and that I've definitely found that to be the case myself now being in business for 15 years. Uh, when, you, when you look at it from that perspective, from that scope, we, we've done a lot, uh, but it didn't always feel that way early on in, you know, when I was in the middle of it year after year. 
do you do you feel like you have any particular activities that you've built to be able to see maybe on a more rapid basis what you've been able to do because i think you've you've hit on something really important it is so hard for someone starting out in their journey to be able to have that patience and to be able to say I am doing this, I'm doing this well, we are making moves. Rather, they're thinking about what they haven't accomplished yet. Do you mm -hmm. have any sort of skills or activities, maybe a way that you've been able to look at progress over a monthly or a yearly or even a weekly basis that you could share with us? Yes, yeah, so you have to measure. You know, you have to build a system for measurement. Uh, I think it's, it's Drucker that says what gets measured gets improved, right? And I, I think a lot of times if, if you're relying on your own arbitrary uh, perception of whether things are moving forwards or backwards. It's, it's not always an accurate outlook. You're, you're sometimes too close to the situation to see the change that's happening. So you need to look at what, you know, the, the, the KPIs are, you know, the specific things that you want to be measuring that move the needle for your individual business, whatever that might be. It can be as simple as revenue. It could be uh, measurement, you know, metrics that are important to your particular industry. Uh, but but find a couple, you know, maybe four or five uh, that you can measure on an ongoing basis and, and keep a log. It could be as simple as creating a spreadsheet and, you know, uh, logging those measurements each week or each month or each quarter. Uh, I would say don't get too caught up in measuring the week to week progress because sometimes that's misleading. It's about building something for the long term. Uh, so when you're doing that, you know, sometimes it's, it's tough to measure some of the growth that's happening on a week by week basis. Um, but measurement is important. So look at the quarterly metrics you should be tracking in your business and look back on them. Once you've been doing this for, you know, a couple of years or, or a decade, look back on what those, where you were at all of those different points along the way. Uh, and then you can really start to see that growth compound. Absolutely. I think you've, you're talking almost about building hindsight and building it in a way that encourages you to always be looking forward. Because if you are able to have a full quarter of those most important KPIs that you have identified and be able to see how much you've grown quarter per quarter, it's that sense of that's where we've been. This is how much we've learned and this is where we're going. So I think that's such a, that's such a great practice to build. And what a better way to get your team members excited too by reviewing them on whatever, whatever basis not weekly kind of works for them. Exactly. <laughs> I love that. Uh, diving in a little bit more kind of off, off of that conversation that we're having, because another thing that I feel kind of stops people from being able to see that long term. And as you said, they're really built for the long term, which is uh, next gen HQ value. So you, you hit on that really well, um, are mistakes or failures or big blunders that they kind of hit along their journey. I think that can be one of the most off-putting things for an entrepreneur to be able to face when they do come across an obstacle that seems like they can't get past it. So from your personal experience, if you don't mind just sharing with us, what do you feel is a mistake or a failure that you've made on your journey? And what was the big learning that you kind of took away from that that has gotten you to where you are today? Mm -hmm. Well, there's been a lot of them, uh, you know, which is, I think the first lesson you, everybody should, you know, take to heart is that there, there are going to be lots of them. And as your company grows, uh, you know, every milestone means you kind of need to rebuild everything, all of your systems, all of your processes. You need to figure out how to rebuild everything to get to that next level. Uh, so it, it, it's a, it's a never-ending process of constantly reiterating and, and rebuilding uh, to, to keep growing. But I would say for me early on, one of those mistakes was not building a team fast enough. Uh, you know, in the beginning, you, uh, you know, you start making some money and you want to protect your margins. Uh, you know, and, and, and maybe you just don't even want to take what you consider might be too much risk too early on. Uh, but the problem is the longer you wait to build that team and you're still growing the company in, in, in the meantime, uh, you get to a point at, at, at some point in the journey where you hit a wall and you realize that you, you, can't, you, know, you can't deliver and you can't sell and you can't market and all of these different things just by yourself or just a few of you. Um, and, and the problem is once you hit that wall, it's usually in, in some respects, it's already too late, uh, to, to realize that, okay, now I need to build this team because you're going to start losing momentum, uh, because you've hit that wall. So now you've got to start building a team. You've got to start hiring. You've got to start spending money as you're losing momentum. Uh, so it's much better to do that on the ramp up, uh, than, you know, waiting until it's almost too late and you've got to play catch up. So that, that was a lesson that I, I wish I knew sooner. 
I love that. And you know what? You you face that and you did learn from it. So you can inspire other people to not be in that same situation. I am one of those people who believes that there is a reason that we take and do every single action in our lives. So just think think on it on that scale. You had to face that so that way you can inspire thousands of others to not go through and not lose that momentum in the hiring process. I love that. You mentioned you mentioned a word that I want to pick up on and ask a follow-up question to. You said the word risk. And I think risk is, it's all about what entrepreneurship is, right? These entrepreneurs are taking a risk for putting their ideas out into the world, for starting a company, for saying, you know what, I'm going to get out of a corporate nine to five and start something for myself. Did you ever find yourself really abhorrent to risk? Or was it something that you feel like has come pretty naturally to you along your journey? Uh, it, it's a good question. I, I would say that, uh, you know, as an entrepreneur, people generally, the, you know, the, the conception is that uh, entrepreneurs are risk takers, right? Uh, and, and in some respects, that's probably true. Uh, because if, if you were completely risk averse, you would probably be uh, you know, looking to work for somebody else rather than starting your own business. Um, but as far as entrepreneurs go, I, I do consider myself more on more towards the end of being risk averse relatively speaking, um, you know, which is why earlier on in, in the company, uh, like I said, I, I didn't hire that team as, as quickly as I should have. Um, so, I mean, you know, risk is a very subjective thing. I would say you need to figure out what's comfortable for you, uh, but you also still need to be able to move outside of your comfort zone a little bit and start taking calculated risks, uh, meaning there needs to be a plan, you know, you need to have a strategy, uh, there needs to be systems in place. You need to be executing consistently. Uh, it, it's not taking blind risk of, uh, you know, quitting my job and, and just starting up a business when I have no money in my bank account to pay my rent next month. Uh, so you know, there needs to be risk, but it, it also, there needs to be a plan and there needs to be uh, some calculation behind what you're willing to sacrifice and what you think the w reward on the other side of that is going to be. Absolutely. You, you said it perfectly there, living outside of your comfort zone, but not, not so far outside of it that you can't find any way back or you have created a space for yourself to potentially fail in the long run because you have nothing that's really kind of grounding you towards, towards success or towards future success that's coming. Mm -hmm. I love yep. that. I love that. Fantastic. So maybe maybe on, on uh, in this realm of something that you may have already mentioned, we're going to move into our next question, which is always one of my favorites to ask, because we are all at NextGen about building habits and routines and practices that are successful for both business and life. So we want to flip, flip the switch here a little bit and ask, what is one life habit that empowers you to be your best every single day? Well, you know, getting up early would definitely be, so I have a one-year-old at home, so th there are a lot of life habits right now that, you know, are not necessarily happening because there's so much, there's so much craziness. Um, but, you know, getting up early has been a habit that I've, I've always had since I was really young. And, and I think, you know, it's, it's really benefited me uh, in terms of productivity, both personally and in, in professionally. Um, so I, you know, for me personally, I, I would say getting up early having a routine that I go through in, in the morning before, before I touch my phone, before I start working, uh, before all of those outside stressors, having a routine in place that allows you to you know, kind of get to your center and, and find some balance, uh, find an equilibrium, and then go tackle whatever it is that's on your to-do list for that day. Okay, so I definitely have another question on that. If you wake up early, does that mean you also go to bed early? That's always where I get myself. I'm I'm usually up and out of by 5 a.m., but I'm, I go to bed at midnight or so, and that's pr probably slowly yeah. killing me, but it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I do go to bed early, uh, you know, I, and I know plenty of people who, who don't, you know, and kind of, so to speak, they burn it at both ends, uh, uh, you know, and I, there are also different chapters in your life, you know, that there were definitely chapters in my life where I was sleeping four or five hours a night, uh, you know, and, and now I, I try to get seven, eight hours of sleep a night, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when possible, again, like I, I have a one year old. So Aww. before that, you know, I was, I, was in a, I was in a chapter where I was trying to get that seven or eight hours of sleep per night. Yep. Um, so, you know, you have to figure out what works for you. Everybody, uh, you know, everybody performs differently. You know, you might be a night owl. 
Um, so you have to figure out what, what works best for you. But I, I, I guess you okay. could say from a health standpoint, it's better to, to at least get six or seven hours of sleep <laughs> per night. Probably that is that is the best thing to do. You know what? This comes at an interesting com interesting point too in the conversation because it, it seems like more people are trying to get into that healthier habit of waking up early and going to bed early. I've seen a lot of people just whom I follow on Instagram and other social media platforms talking a lot about that. But one of the most inspiring things that I've heard in that discussion of people trying to build this habit for themselves is the, the idea of self-care that they added to that and then it, and the idea of it's okay if you can't meet up to that every single day and you have a day or a week that's a little bit off from that to be kind to yourself and to not totally put yourself on the rails because you didn't wake up at 5 a.m like you wanted to or you went to bed past a certain time that you wanted to i think there's there's so much beauty in that idea of let's build habits and practices that will help us be our best selves but let's also create the space for us to fail at those even going back to that idea of of failure and mistakes we just chatted about yeah yeah it's, it's a good point uh you know you need to it, it's good to have habits because it's good to have consistency in life right that that creates a more predictable outcome um but at the same time you can't beat yourself up if, if you're not uh you know batting a, a perfect average um you know we're all humans so you have to give yourself a little bit of space to fail and that's in business and in personal life um so yeah you, you have to figure out which of those habits work for you based on your personality i actually read a book recently called why we sleep um which was a, a pretty popular book that's come out in the past year or two and it kind of you know really breaks down the science of what sleep is and and why the body needs it and and you know how to optimize your sleep um, and it, it's definitely had an impact on me. So I, I would say that, you know, even if you are building a company and I know it's, it's cool to talk about how much you hustle 24 uh, seven, and there are a lot of influencers who love to sell that. Um, but you, you do have to find, no matter how much you're working, you have to figure out some kind of you know, system and, and set of habits that you can use to take care of yourself because it's, it's not, it's not that sustainable doing it for 15, 20 years. Um, so things to keep in mind. <laughs> that is a whole other conversation that you and I should hop on a Zoom about, the idea of the hustle culture and how I just, I truly think it's so toxic, but you know what, for another day and another conversation. <laughs> Richard, I know we have taken up a bit of your time today, but I just wanna ask you one final question. This comes from a couple of the community members who reached out to us with some, some ideas of what they would love to chat with you about. Uh, and it seems like what a lot of them wanted to know was kind of thinking about those early days of Fifth Avenue Brands and you creating that and leading the development of it. What do you feel is one, or if there are a few here, some of the most important actions you took in the very beginning that has allowed you to grow into what you are today, which I know to be an award-winning PR firm with so many accolades behind your name. Do you associate that to any actions from the early days? Uh, you, you, you know, you have to, simple business models are always better. Uh, so, you know, there are a lot of companies that, that start off, whether it's a product or a service in the beginning, they, they want to sell 10 different products or 10 different services to a bunch of different markets. Uh, and, you know, it, I, I understand the, you know, the reasoning is that you don't want to miss out on opportunity. Uh, but the problem is you can't always be everything to everybody. And I think one of the things that we did early on that really helped us scale uh, was figuring out what's the one thing by the way, there's a book called The One Thing by Gary Keller. That's a great book. It kind of influenced my thinking on this. Uh, what's the one thing that we can do better than everybody else? Um, you know, and at the time we were a full service agency selling digital marketing and PR and content marketing and search engine optimization. And we realized that we were creating uh, the most value for our clients within PR and specifically within media relations. Uh, so we started niching down everything that we did to be oriented around PR. Uh, so that was our one thing. And we started selling it to one specific market. Most of our clients are in finance or they're in public policy or, or you know, the B2B space. Um, so that's our niche. And once we did that, it became, it became a lot easier to start selling and, and marketing to a very concentrated market and really be able to target the limited resources that we had in terms of sales and marketing into scaling. Uh, so simple business model, one product to one person. 
uh, is, is a really good way to start. As you get bigger, you can diversify, but in the beginning, you have limited resources, so you know, simplify. Um, like I said earlier, hire a team you know, as early on as you can. It's better to start building systems and processes before you really need them. Uh, this way, you can prevent a lot of growing pains later on as you start to scale. Um, so if, if you do those two things earlier on, uh, you're probably going to be ahead of a lot of the other early stage companies in your space that, uh, you know, are still making those mistakes. I think you hit on something so critical there in a conversation I was actually just getting into with someone two days ago or so, the idea of focus and how if we try to be everything to everyone, we actually end up being nothing to no one because there's there's not that focus and there's not that priority that we can really add to being great at one thing, one product, one niche. So I think that's, that's so critical what you've just been able to identify there. Start with one and know that it will help you scale to be the 12 different things or the 12 different products that you want to be down in the future. But that doesn't have to be, that doesn't have to be and probably shouldn't be the day one mentality. Exactly. Yep. I love, I love that. Richard, it's officially been about 30 minutes or so, so I do have to go ahead and let you go. But we just wanted to take a quick second to say thank you so much for coming on to Moment Mentor Momentum and sharing all of your advice and your stories with us. It truly impacts our audience so much, I can't even tell you. Thank you, Rachel. I had a great time. Amazing, amazing. Next Gen Fam, we are going to see you soon for another episode of Mentor Momentum. Bye, everyone. That was Mentor Momentum, sharing life and business lessons from incredible leaders. Looking for more momentum? Subscribe to our weekly Momentum newsletter at nextgenhq.com and check out our other podcast, Momentum Audio, on any of your favorite podcast channels. Now that's Momentum.